My name is Haytham Abufkyo. I am uh, the engineering manager of the flight team. Uh, but, uh, you know, don't let that fool you. Uh, I have made and continue to make commits to most of the repos. Uh, and I'm not only talking about PC comics. Um, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm here today to uh, walk you through our journey of why we built flight um, and, uh, you know, touch a little bit on the architecture, uh, the, you know, some highlights, some of the features, and uh, I have three demos, uh, um, you know, lined up for you. Uh, so, you know, what are the odds? They will work perfectly, uh, but we'll see. Uh, and then we'll conclude with, you know, hopefully a, a call to action uh, for you. Um, so let's uh, get right into it. Uh, this diagram uh, represents data flow across various systems at Lyft, uh, and many of them are building machine learning models. Uh, some of them are, you know, strictly doing data processing. Uh, it's usually required to build, you know, some other model downstream, uh, probably by some other team. Uh, each of the boxes, of course, just a simplification for illustration. Like you will uh, probably recognize some of these teams. Uh, there are like large teams behind each of them. Uh, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, overshadow that. Um, but the, the interesting uh, uh, fact uh, I'm trying to highlight here is uh, this is a huge system across Lyft, and it's all currently powered by flight. Uh, we have thousands and thousands of uh, unique workflows. Uh, and we like uh, we schedule millions of containers uh, every month, um, and like even with the current scale, we feel we're just getting started. Uh, there are like many customers internally and externally onboarding on the platform, uh, and you know taking it taking the scale to a whole new level. Um, just uh, uh, like I wanted to highlight what where flight fits in, and we typically start talking about ML like your ML code. Uh, and, you know, your choice of a framework, a TensorFlow or Power Tours, or, you know, no judgment there, um, uh, or, you know, what uh, algorithm to use and so on and so forth. Uh, but I wanted to highlight that when we, when we talk about taking a, a, a model and deploying it in production, uh, there are a lot more things we, we have to consider. Um, and those are usually not ML problems, they are more of distributed systems problems. Uh, that enable your code to run, you know, at scale, uh, run reliably, repeatedly, uh, and produce predictable results uh, every time. Um, and uh, to zoom in a little bit on, on the, the one of the uh, use cases where flight fits in, uh, in, uh, in the highlight of, uh, you know, a, a typical life cycle of an ML, developing an ML model, uh, you don't start from, you know, writing the code uh, that does the machine learning, right? You start from way, you know, the bottom left corner here where you have data coming into the system and to like your company or whatever. Uh, and there are like different types of data you, uh, you ingest um, and, uh, uh, and then you run some transformation on them. Uh, you do some, you know, prep work, clean up, you know, delete like nil values and so on. Um, then you compute features on top of those uh, and those are, you know, usually reusable features across multiple models. Um, and that's when you then start writing your code or uh, discovering those features and writing uh, a model on top. Um, and you don't stop here, of course, right? You, uh, you then need some continuous monitoring for, you know, both the data coming in, detect, you know, distribution, drifts in distribution and so on. Um, and then, of course, uh, like a continuous, you know, feedback loop from, uh, once you, you ship the model to a, a scalable serving platform. Um, you, you often need to run the same models over and over again uh, as maybe new data come in or as you change your code uh, for any of these steps. Um, and when that happens, uh, and like, take my word for this, we, we have lived through this, uh, you will really appreciate not having to you know, hunt for uh, code that lives on somebody's laptop or, uh, you know, and so on uh, to, to retrain those models. Um, and uh, the, the highlight of this graph, and I'm not including all the icons for all the tools uh, that do these steps, uh, but as it is, you, you see the graph is very colorful and it's full of logos of different systems uh, that do excellent work uh, where they fit in, right? Um, you have, you know, Spark doing great in, in like your MapReduce jobs uh, and so on. 
uh, you have TensorFlow or PyTorch or, uh, or Skillern, like whatever you use, uh, doing great job at like the, the training phase. Um, and uh, because they are very different, they don't always, uh, they were not always designed with interop in mind. Um, so it's, it's sometimes very hard to, uh, you know, take something uh, that, you know, you ran on a Spark job and then massage the data so that it fits in some other system uh, to then run a training job and feed that back and so on. And that's where Flight comes in. Um, uh, Flight offers uh, uh, production grade orchestration for data and ML. Uh, can orchestrate code, containers, scripts, queries um, across all of these dis uh, disparate systems. Um, and the, the key for how we do this is we, we, we offer a strongly typed uh, interface, a strongly typed language, um, and, uh, uh, and definitions of declaration language that is language agnostic. Uh, we use both of us. Um, so with having flight power, uh, like all of these pipelines enable you to uh, connect very seamlessly uh, systems that were never meant to be connected, uh, if I may say, uh, to uh, make these pipelines predictable and scale, uh, scale to a very large numbers uh, and, and volumes. Um, uh, when we designed Flight, there were a few tenants that we uh, wanted to highlight or, or focus on. Uh, it's, a, it's a hosted orchestration platform, um, and that takes away the need from uh, you know, data scientists or you know, engineers to figure out how to deploy an orchestration platform or how to run it reliably or do the DevOps for it. Uh, they only focus on what matters to them, their business logic for uh, how these boxes connect and what to do in each box. Um, it's, a, it's a fabric that connects you know, all of these open source technologies or not open source as you'll see later on. Um, and it makes it extremely easy to deploy within your core infrastructure. Uh, we, we aim at simplifying your uh, like auditability for the workloads and share it, shareability between uh, you know, tasks or common, uh, common tasks that uh, maybe you, know, you have your central team in, in, uh, in your company that develops uh, common you know, algorithms or common steps in this pipeline. Uh, you know, um, maybe there's a common task to split data uh, fairly, right? And, uh, or, or to detect bias and things like that. Uh, so you can share those across different projects. You don't have to rewrite, constantly rewrite things uh, or worry about dependencies, uh, does it, you know, or conflict of dependencies and, uh, and dependency resolution. Um, it's, uh, it's built with observability in mind. So once you ship a pipeline to production, it doesn't end there, right? Uh, you want to know that it's constantly running when it doesn't run on the scheduled time and so on. You want to be notified. You want to know how much memory you know, certain tasks are using or how to optimize this uh, workflow. Uh, so like we, we build a lot of metrics and a, with a lot of thought into uh, how we make your uh, pipelines automatically observable. Uh, again, not having to think about any of these things, you just think about your business logic. Um, and, uh, and lastly, as a system, the system itself, it's the same team that built Flight uh, in Lyft that also hosts flight, uh, so it runs the DevOps for flight, and that forced us uh, to also think about uh, how to do DevOps for the platform itself um, very well, uh, very efficiently. Uh, so the system itself is very observable. Um, we, we have, it's auditable, you know who ran, which workflows, when, and what data it accessed, and all of that. Uh, you know what the current load of the system is and what is it spending time doing, uh, and when there are problems happening, you know where um, there are SLOs that we guarantee to the rest of the, to our customers. And like all of this uh, is shared in the open source uh, version of Flight uh, that we released last year. Um, and uh, uh, I, I would like to like dig a little di bit deeper and try to understand uh, Flight uh, leading up to the demo when we start writing uh, co Flight code. Right, and uh, there are a few concepts uh, we should uh, you should grasp first. To start off, um, there is there is a notion of organizing your flight uh, artifacts uh, into projects. Uh, so this is the top level entity in the system. Um, we you can think of projects as maybe your map for teams um, in a company, or you can have one team owning multiple projects and so on. It's up to you for how to 
uh, do this partitioning, but it's a, it's a unit to organize your things, uh, your pipelines and tasks. Um, and then within those projects, uh, there are domains that your flight admin uh, can define. They apply to all projects. Um, in, in Lyft, we have all the default, default uh, uh, flight deployments. You get development, staging, and production, and you can think of those as deployment rings to your own pipelines, right? So you start off uh, with a new workflow or a task in the developing domain. You iterate on it, uh, you know, fix bugs and try different things, try different uh, interfaces, different inputs, outputs, and so on. And when you are happy with what you have, uh, you move it to staging and production, and that signals to the team, the rest of your colleagues, and so on, that it's it's ready for people to use. Um, uh, and then we have uh, uh, within those domains, as I said, you have uh, workflows and tasks uh, that you can define, and uh, uh, and you can share them across different projects, and so on. Uh, so you can have one project, you know, your common tools for ML, for example, right? Uh, where you write all those tasks that people can use and then specific teams have their own projects and they can just pull in those tasks to use. Uh, and it's very easy to search for the tasks and workflows and there's description and you know, the UI will get to in a minute, uh, offers you like tools around this. Um, uh, the, the tasks and workflows, yeah, like uh, worth probably digging, it, uh, digging into a bit deeper uh, because this is the fundament these are the fundamental building blocks uh, for, uh, for your pipelines. And uh, each task represents an indivisible unit of computation uh, from flight point of view. Uh, so you can think of them as maybe it's a single container that runs and does something, or a query that runs in BigQuery or a Presto query and so on, just like a SQL query. Uh, or maybe it's a distributed Spark job that, that will spam multiple containers and exhibitors to do something. Um, or distributed TensorFlow job, or maybe calling a service like SageMaker uh, to run a training job there, right? They can be completely different concepts, uh, but the, the, the basic idea is that uh, it, it has, from flight point of view, it has three main components. Uh, it has an input interface that will define strongly what uh, inputs it expect and what types those are uh, using flight typing system. And it has some execution body can be you know, a, qu a query, a container, and so on. Uh, and then it has an output uh, interface as well. And uh, uh, being very opinionated about how about defining inputs and output interfaces uh, allow us to at, like, statically verify that your, um, that your entire graph uh, uh, will like, you know, fit together, uh, that this task can actually co consume outputs from that other task. Uh, because you know the, the, the interfaces match, uh, just like any you know programming language with static typing, um, the 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 flight typing system is declarative. Uh, we are using protobufs for that, so you can uh, define your tasks and workflows in any language you want, as long as you can produce the same protobuf definitions declaration uh, for them. And in fact, I like uh, I'm not sure if anybody from Spotify is on the call, but uh, shout out to them. Uh, Spotify, I think, announced last week or the week before uh, that they are adopting flights uh, for their uh, workflows as well uh, internally. And they didn't only consume what we have in open source; they immediately contributed back um, an SDK written in Java that allows you to write uh, uh, tasks and workflows in Java as well. Um, besides the, the default SDK we, we have uh, written in Python. Uh, so you get complete interop between these two SDKs. Uh, so somebody can write a, you know, a, a maybe a Spark uh, a Scala uh, application uh, task that does one thing and then you consume it in a Python workflow that does something else, uh, one of those steps being Spark. Um, uh, on, on the right hand side here, uh, you know, we have you know just a fictional workflow, but it has the, you know three inputs and it's calling a Spark task and a Python task, and they all look um, uh, similar in that sense. Uh, they have an interface and a body and so on. Um, the workflows are uh, composable, so you can uh, not only run tasks uh, you know, within a workflow, you can run other workflows. Um, there are, they are dynamic. You can run, you can even produce as one of the nodes in a workflow. You can produce further nodes uh, or further workflows uh, based on you know, the inputs or, uh, or some logic you have. Uh, 
Um, so it's completely flexible uh, in, in execution and definition languages. Um, we provide uh, a DSL in Python to declare all of this uh, to get you started, but you know, do not stop there. Um, the, there are a ton of other features I included in the slides, but I skipped over here. Uh, so they will be available for you after the talk uh, to go over and you know, uh, review uh, what you missed. Uh, but the one thing I wanted to highlight, the other feature I wanted to highlight is uh, called Data Catalog. Um, it's, uh, it's a separate service that also ships with Flight, written as part of Flight, and uh, Flight comes with you know, one implementation of that. Uh, but it's, it's swappable, you can have your own implementation, it will only the syncs. Um, and what this offers uh, are two imp very important uh, uh, features for Flight. Uh, it offers memoization, uh, out-of-box memoization. And what I mean by that is uh, at any given task, you can, if you opt in for this task, uh, Flight can record the inputs uh, or like a signature for the execution of this task and the output artifacts it produced. Um, so that if anybody else uh, in the company uh, or any other workflow or in the same workflow ran the same task again with the same structure, the same version, the same inputs, uh, it will not really run again. Uh, it will automatically produce the outputs it produced before um, and then move on. And it will you know, look very seamless from the workflow execution perspective. Uh, it will look like it ran, but it hasn't. And you can see that in the UI, of course. Um, but it gives you this uh, added uh, uh, benefit that you can you know, iterate on a workflow. Let's say you have tens of tasks in a workflow, um, and you had a bug in, a, in the last one of them, right? And uh, you ran the workflow. Everything succeeded. The last one failed you go iterate on this, fix it, and then run the entire workflow. Uh, and you don't want you know, all the other uh, tasks to run again. Uh, so with this, it will, like, everything will look like it ran, it, but it will not. And then the last one that failed before will run and keep going. Um, the other important feature is lineage. And because it is tracking all of the, um, the, the inputs and what artifacts are used where, uh, you can uh, build this tree or like lineage tree uh, for any artifact. You start from you know, very like a leaf node artifact and tell me which workflow produced that. And then from that workflow, tell me which artifacts it produced, it's consumed and where are they coming from and so on and so forth. Um, so the, the, you know, the ML life cycle I showed, you can look at like the very right corner with a, with a, a produced model and then track all the way to uh, the data tables that uh, end up produce this, or the versions of those data tables that end up produce this model across the system, across teams, and so on. Um, with that, uh, I will touch very lightly on the basic architecture of, uh, uh, of flight. Um, and we have dug a little bit deeper on, on these topics in separate talks before uh, that you can you know, look up. Uh, so just uh, just as a brief um, uh, glance over the architecture, it's a very classical cloud system uh, architecture with a user plane, uh, control plane, and data plane. Um, what we uh, what, what forms our control plane is some is a service called Flight Admin and the console being the UI service. Uh, together they form this control plane that uh, uh, that you know that users interact with. And then they decide where executions happen. They track the entities in the system and so on. Um, and then we have Flight Propeller. And, uh, and that's uh, an, a Kubernetes operator, um, uh, along with you know, various operators you might deploy on the cluster. This act as your data plane where executions happen. Um, first, uh, it's not limited to running things on Kubernetes. Uh, uh, there, are, there is a plugin system, uh, as I mentioned before. Uh, it's very, that, that was one of the, the tenants when we built flight, I think it was maybe the second doc I wrote uh, was about uh, uh, extensibility uh, in flight. Um, and all of the uh, integrations flight comes with uh, are already written in um, uh, with the same plugin model. Uh, so you can run you know on things on Kubernetes or elsewhere. Uh, and with this architecture, we, we uh, have run and continue to run huge number of workflows uh, on flight uh, within Lyft. Uh, this chart uh, is, I think, uh, goes over a year. 
It's already a month old. Uh, but with this, you can see we already doubled. It shows the number of workflows we have daily. Uh, it, I think, tripled over this one year, and uh, it's probably already outdated. Uh, outdated, and uh, it's it's. I'm not sure how much now, how many uh, workflows we run now. Uh, we, you know, th last I checked was about 40 million containers a month, uh, and you know, thousands of workflows uh, executions um, uh, defined and executed. Uh, and now to my favorite part, uh, the demos. Uh, as I mentioned, I have uh, three demos lined up for you. Um, we will start, they, they are in the increase in uh, complexity. Um, and uh, the, the first one I would like to start with is something we call uh, uh, a notebook task, right? So we, we increasingly see uh, people start with like writing their uh, email code in notebooks. So we wanted to meet them where they are. Um, and I have a setup here with the virtual environment and Jupyter Notebook and our SDK, uh, uh, in the Python SDK called uh, FlightKit. Uh, so we'll create a notebook. Um, and this notebook as a whole will be presented to Flight as one task. Right, not will not partition cells or anything to run the entire notebook as a single task. Um, and to achieve that, we're using a project, an open source project called Paper Mill. Shout out to these guys. Um, uh, to to do that, uh, you there are expectations about this task. Right, uh, we use tags uh, in in Jupyter to indicate to Flight which cells uh, in uh, represent the inputs. Uh, this allows us to, when we launch the, the, the task, that we can fill in the, the, the real values of inputs. So you don't have to read them uh, here. It will automatically happen for you. Um, so, you know, let's say you will have uh, 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 two inputs, A and B, and we will perform a very complex mathematical operation of summing the, both of them. Uh, and then let's print that. Uh, you can run this. You know, it will use the inputs, of course, you defined here. Um, and it looks good. You can have as many cells as you want here. You can have visualizations and graphs and plot things and so on. Um, and then the last cell uh, has, uh, uh, has to be, uh, uh, well, not doesn't have to be the last one. You have to have a cell that defines what of all the variables you might define you know, within your notebook should we consider as outputs. Um, and this might be a bit clunky and looking for ways to uh, not have to do this. Uh, but for now, you have to record, call flight and say record uh, uh, this variable as the output uh, for the workflow, for, sorry, for the, uh, the notebook task. Uh, so you can run this. And what this does is it, it wraps your variable uh, with a protobuf um, that flight understands or can interpret and, uh, uh, and then make available for subsequent tasks to consume. Um, the, to, to start using this task, um, I, I have written this other notebook, uh, so you don't have to write it here. Uh, we will just run it and see how things work, right? So the, the first thing you would want to do um, is unit test it, right? If you're running it locally on your excuse me, on your machine. Um, and, uh, and to do so, you can call this uh, unit test function on the, the notebook, the defined notebook task with inputs, right? So you can try different inputs. And uh, running that will just run the, uh, the, the entire notebook, uh, you know, does the pass the inputs, uh, compute the output, and then give you back what this, the result of this variable is. Uh, so all looking good, you know, you might have bugs here, fix them and so on. Uh, and then what uh, comes next is I want to then run it on a cluster uh, to validate. It should run pretty much the same way if I, unless I do something wrong with my um, requirements, uh, you know, the PIP requirements or so on. Uh, so to do that, we, we encourage everyone to always continuize their tasks. Uh, so have this uh, Docker file that will include the notebook in uh, with a version. We also encourage you to use unique versions. Internally at Lyft, we use SHAZ, like you get SHA, um, as the version of the, the image. So you can always tie back the exact version of the code that produced uh, you know, a workflow or a pipeline. Uh, I have already built this before, you know, so it was pretty quick. 
Um, next up is you, uh, you then register the notebook. So you tell the flight system, hey, I have uh, this notebook task um, with, uh, uh, you know, with a certain spec. Um, and to do that, you pull this register function with the project and domain, the, the, con the constructs I was talking about earlier, um, with a specific name and a specific version. Um, and uh, that gives you back uh, a unique ID that, you know, anybody can use to consume this task from a different project, a different notebook, and so on. Um, I am connecting to a local uh, cluster. I am running it on my machine in, uh, in Docker. Um, and then next, you can then launch it, right? And it looks pretty much similar to how you launch, how you did the unit test, except you use launch function. Uh, and you tell it where to run this. Um, and then you pass the inputs to the, to the task. Um, and this gives you back a URL to look at uh, for the execution. Um, and let's go here and you know, walk you a little bit over, uh, uh, through the, the, the UI. This is the execution UI. You get at the top level, the top uh, corner here, the, the, high, the overall status of the execution. Um, and then you can view the inputs uh, on the outputs when it's done. Uh, you get some information about the more execution uh, information here. If you're running a multi-cluster setup, uh, which we do in production at Lyft, uh, you get the cluster name here so you can um, easily know where things are and it's already done. Uh, and then you get two views for the execution. There's a node view with the list of all the nodes and the graph view it shows you the data flow between nodes. And we'll look at a more complex example later to see that. Um, you can click on the node to see, uh, to get the site panel with more information about the logs. And uh, if, if, you, if it failed before, like, there are multiple attempts to run it. You get all of these here. I can see the inputs and outputs it produced. And you can see uh, this task produced output 11 because the inputs were five and six. Great. Um, and then, um, uh, and also it's, it automatically computes the output uh, notebook, right? So if you have, you know, if you drew images or graphs or whatever in, in, uh, in some cells in that notebook, you can download this and see all the outputs computed uh, for all the cells. The last tab here is called task. And this is from flight's point of view, how you define uh, uh, the, the, the task. It's a protobuf object. Um, and so it's uh, language agnostic, uh, it has an ID section, it's globally addressable within the flight system, uh, it has a type, some metadata, and it has this a strongly typed interface with the inputs and outputs, uh, the types and, you know, description and so on. Um, and uh, it has this, a section for what to execute. And in this case, it's a container, the command, and some variables and, you know, a Docker image to run, and this should all look familiar. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so we looked at the inputs here and that was our first demo, success. Uh, <laughs> you can go back here and uh, you know, we, have, we provide this convenient function to wait for the execution if you, are, um, you know, if you want to execute subsequent things in um, a notebook or some other way. Um, and it's already said it's done. For my uh, second demo, um, I will, Sorry about that. Um, we will use a different task type. We, uh, we already looked at a notebook task. We will try uh, a shell task, right? So we'll do the same operation we did. Uh, There's a very complex mathematical operation of summing two numbers uh, in shell this time. And, uh, um, and then we can write, uh, we'll write a workflow that does both of them. You can see which one finishes first, right? Um, so to do that, you define a container task and things should start to look familiar now. You also define inputs, outputs, uh, interfaces, right? The names of the inputs, the outputs, and the types, uh, the Docker image, the, the image to use, and then a command to run. Um, and we will automatically fight at one time, we'll substitute these with the real values of uh, your inputs, and then use this file as the, uh, as it matches the name of the variable, um, as the value of the output. Uh, and if, you know, if it fails to uh, cast it to a float, you will get a runtime error. Uh, and then to define a workflow, we, uh, uh, you write a class, a Python class, uh, with this annotation. And, and 
uh, it will also look familiar here because you define inputs and outputs, pipes, and then the body is like the, 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 the set of attributes or nodes to execute to, um, to produce this output. Uh, in this case, I am running uh, the shell task and the interactive Python task with the passing the inputs um, and then pointing uh, the outputs as uh, the outputs of these tasks. Uh, and we can launch it from here, but I thought we'd launch it from the UI to see how that looks like. Uh, so this is the homepage you get uh, uh, when you have a flight installation. It lists all the projects. You can search for them. You get the domains and login. Uh, I don't have login enabled in my local setup. Um, I registered this workflow in Flight Snacks, right? So I can go there and you get the view of the project with the with two uh, panels for workflows and tasks. Uh, I only have this one workflow registered. You can click on that and you get a view of all the past executions for workflow. You can filter and so on. And you can launch that. Um, you, get, you can pick the version. Um, you know, I have like, two versions registered and it automatically picks the last one. Um, we can run uh, and give inputs and, um, and execute this workflow. Takes you to the uh, execution page, um, right? It looks similar now uh, with both of them. And if you look at the graph here, they are running in parallel uh, because there is no dependency between the two tasks. They are both consuming the inputs from the workflow. Um, and you get, uh, so this already started uh, with logs and so on. Uh, this one is still waiting. Uh, when they're done, you will get view with like success uh, for these five seconds and this is a minute. And that's it's only because uh, this ran first um, and all my local machine don't have capacity to run both of them in parallel. Uh, so this waited, um, so it took longer. Uh, with that, and that is my second demo. Um, and for third demo, be really quick. I will not try to run anything. We'll just uh, walk through it. Um, a more real example of, uh, uh, of a training workflow. Uh, in this example, I have a graph that uh, runs a, a Presto tasks to pull in data and then convert the data uh, from Parquet format to CSV then run, the, uh, run a training algorithm um, in, uh, in SageMaker, in Amazon, uh, AWS SageMaker, um, and then produce the output being the model, right? And you get links here for, uh, uh, you know, to access uh, SageMaker and monitor your job in the platform as it's running. Uh, you can see the logs and so on while things are happening. Um, and to do all of this, uh, I wrote this, uh, this all happened again on a notebook. Uh, and we'll make all of these notebooks available um, in, in a, uh, Flight Snacks uh, uh, repo um, with you know, more documentation about uh, how things work. Uh, for this, I wrote a Presto task. And again, things should look familiar. There are inputs. Uh, in this case, they're empty. And I have a query. Um, and I registered the task. And I have another task that, that gets the you know, validation data from a different table. Of course, in real time, in real examples, this will not be the case. You will pull all the data and have some split function, uh, but just for, to, for simplicity's sake. Uh, and then for the, the conversion to, uh, from Parquet to CSV, I am using a task you know, somebody else wrote. I am also, I'm just fetching it. Uh, so you need to know the, the unique ID for this task, the project domain is defined, and the name and the version of this. So you're kind of pinning. Uh, to this version uh, of the task. Uh, and from this point on, you can use it just like any other uh, task you define yourself. Um, and then for the training, the training task uh, step, uh, we define a SageMaker task uh, that you know, we wrote as part of integration with SageMaker. Um, you create the training task, and I even created a, a hyperparameter tuning on top of that training task, uh, and then registering that. Um, and then you write a workflow that uh, does all of, that runs all of this, right? You first get the data and pass the data to this conversion function, get back CSV, then pull the HPO task, uh, and then finally the clear out to being the model of this workflow. Um, and I launch it from here, and you get back an execution URL, and you can wait for it and you know look at the uh, you can use the model for like local prediction if you want later on. 
I'm using data uh, from this open source data set. Um, and uh, the first time I wrote this, uh, it, it failed uh, at the uh, conversion because, and you get the error here, I wanted to show you that, you know, um, demos don't work all the time. Um, uh, and the error was, it, it, like it was I, I forgot to push this image that I built. Uh, so at runtime, it failed to pull the image, got me an error. I fixed that. And next time, uh, you can see the first time the, the press to tasks, press to queries ran. Next time when I fixed this and ran it again, uh, they didn't run, right? It, they were all cached, so you get success immediately. And then it ran from where it failed before, uh, doing those training and validation, you know, conversion and then the training task. Um, just to point, uh, and that, that took about 11 minutes. And then I re ran it once more, uh, and just like everything has been cached already. So nothing ran, uh, but it, it succeeded right away. And with that, um, I think I would call demos success. Um, I, uh, uh, we, uh, as, we, as things stand, uh, this is kind of our ecosystem and it's like uh, expanding very quickly and, uh, um, and like it, it humbles us when we see you know, open source contributions uh, that added uh, the right TensorFlow integration or PyTorch and so on. Some of them are built by us, some like these two are not. Um, and uh, we currently run, Flight is an AWS shop. We run everything on AWS, uh, but our uh, friends at Spotify uh, uh, run Flight on GCP. So we know it works just as well on GCP. Uh, they help us get there. Um, we, we haven't partnered with anyone who runs on Azure, but you know, if, if you, do please give it a shot. Um, it should be agnostic to all the you know the differences between uh, these cloud prov providers. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, and we're looking forward to more uh, more integrations added to it. Uh, so what's next? Where do we go from here? Uh, there are a ton of things that are lined up. We're working on uh, as we speak. Uh, the the flight kit Java is already released uh, thanks to Spotify. Uh, we're working on more visualizations for data catalog to show the lineage and so on, uh, UI improvements and you know and so on and so forth. Uh, we made those all available in the open source uh, flight repo. If you go to GitHub slash flight uh, lift flights, um, or you go you just uh, the, the one stop shop to to learn about everything flight is flight.org. Um, it's uh, you know things are we are like maybe eight months in uh, after the open source, but we are just getting started. And uh, I, I can't wait to see what you all build uh, on flights. Thank you.